Uh, so yes, today is Whiteboard Challenges Workshop. I'm Elise, and my background, why I'm passionate about talking about Whiteboard Challenges is I've spent the last five years building and managing teams in agency settings. So I have a lot of experience giving out Whiteboard Challenges. Uh, but I've also received Whiteboard Challenges myself, and I actually recently just did a Whiteboard Challenge with Facebook. Um, and I also mentor designers. So some of my mentees have recently interviewed at Spotify, SoundCloud, Edmunds, Ship. So pretty large uh, companies that are very design forward. And I've just been learning a lot about the UX interview process from startups to agencies to large enterprise companies. And this is the baby of all of that. This is my learnings of, of um, all produced for you guys today. So tag me, I want all the social media channels, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, everything. And I love seeing your side of the screen. I love when people share like a video of me and like their little desk setup and stuff like that. It's so cool to kind of connect in this way, especially during this time, especially when we're so far away, but can feel a little bit close. So feel free to tag me. Now, this question comes up a lot. Uh, will this presentation be available later to watch? And the answer is yes. And then also, will this presentation be provided to us? So I am gonna give this to you guys in a PDF format. So you guys will have both the video and the presentation. No need to take some crazy notes, but I'm sure people will ask this throughout the chat. So you guys be, <laughs> be wary to tell them, yes, it's gonna be available because people will ask that throughout this, this experience. So speaking of how to participate today, use the chat. I am going to be looking at it, trying to connect with you guys. This is my way of having a back and forth conversation. And I'm gonna ask you guys questions and involve you. So be ready, have a keyboard um, on hand, okay? And let's connect that way. Also, we are going to have time at the end for a Q&A. Jakob is gonna see the uh, questions that are throughout the chat and is gonna ask me those at the end. So if you guys have any major questions, please put that in the chat and those will be answered at the end. All right, so tell me about you guys. First time for you guys to connect. I see you guys are already in there chatting away. Tell me about if you've had any experiences. Have you gone through a UX interview process? Have you done a whiteboard challenge? Are you brand new to UX? And like, I'm just trying to understand all the things around UX. Um, and also, what scares you the most about it? If anything, maybe you're super excited and stoked and confident. Uh, <laughs> but tell me about your experience. So we see some not yet. No, oh, a lot of people brand new. Very new to UX, so cool. I'm excited to be one of the first people to talk to you about something within the UX interview process. Done a few assignments I see here. Okay, cool. Oh, scared that you won't get it right. We're gonna talk about that fear. We're gonna go over that. Hopefully after today's session, you're gonna feel that much more confident. So Monica says, very nervous about interviews. I get it, I totally do. I've been on both sides of the coin. Um, I've also been nervous giving interviews. I don't know if you guys have experienced that. Like I've been nervous doing a whiteboard challenge with somebody. So um, yeah, both sides can be nervous too. So think about that too. We have some people who've just graduated, scared all freeze up. Yes, we're gonna talk about that one as well. We're gonna talk about these fears. We're gonna feel good about it. So what we're covering, what is a whiteboard challenge? <laughs> We've been like posting about this event. People are like, well, what even is it? So we're gonna talk about that. Why do we do these whiteboard challenges? How to be best prepared, common mistakes and fears, like some of the ones you mentioned. What the interviewer is evaluating, as well as how to stand out, right? That's always an important key part of all this. And then finally, we have the Q&A. So what is a whiteboard challenge? Well, yes, it involves a whiteboard. <laughs> so uh, if you are in person, you as the, inter the interviewee is gonna have the whiteboard, some markers, that's gonna be your tool. If it's digital, you might have a digital whiteboard or something like that, like Mural or Miro.com. So those are some options. And what the interviewer is gonna do is they're gonna give you a prompt with a design challenge. 
And then you are going to show your process in solving that design challenge on the whiteboard. <laughs> and then there will be either be just one interviewer watching and observing and evaluating and, and potentially collaborating. Or sometimes it's a team. Sometimes there's five, seven people um, or up to five to seven people. I haven't heard of, about anything more than that. So um, it could be quite small or quite large. So why do we do this? Why do we do this exercise? Is it to make you just like, oh, I'm so uncomfortable <laughs> like this image? No, it's not to put people on the spot and to make them feel really uncomfortable. It's for us as an evaluator to understand how your brain works. And it's really hard to see that in a portfolio or in a case study because you might be working with a whole team. You might say you work on a specific part of the project or you might have really thought through how to communicate some of the problems you've solved in the case study, but it may not be actually a reflection of who you are as a de designer and your actual process. So this gets to the meat of it to really actually see what is the way, how, how do you work? What is the way your brain works? And also to be frank, the design landscape is a bit more competitive right now. So it's a way for us to kind of understand, does this person have a design process? Do they understand UX? Is this person a good candidate for us? So you need to be up to par with this, okay? So let's talk about the UX interview process and where the white challenge fits in. This is typical of what a UX process or UX interview process looks like. First, you might have a phone screening with maybe a recruiter or someone from HR. Then you might have an on-site or a phone interview. Well, they might ask you some questions about yourself, your background, your experience working with engineers, et cetera. And then you'll have the portfolio presentation. This is the first time, first part where you're like, I'm nervous, I'm nervous, where you're going to show your presentation of all the work you've done. You might dive a bit deep into one or two projects. It might be a 30 minute to 40 minute uh, presentation. And then from there, you're going to do a design exercise. Now, this is one of typically two things, the whiteboard challenge exercise or a take home challenge exercise. And it's just like what it sounds like. You get a design prompt, but you get to work at home and then you'll present it later. This exercise sometimes does require designers. We'll work on it. It'll say like five to eight hours. I hear designers who work 20, 30 hours on some of these design exercises. So there's pros and cons to doing the whiteboard versus the take home challenge, right? Whiteboard is more on the spot, but it's done in an hour. With the take home exercise, it might be a long, lengthy experience, right? And then there's some other things you might do an app critique, you might do a second, more uh, informal interview. And this is actually, uh, I just interviewed with Facebook, I did ex all exactly every single one of these steps. So this is really what it looks like. I like to study what the big companies are doing because it has a trickle down effect into all the other smaller agencies and companies and what they do for their hiring process. So good to be uh, aware of what that experience is like. So now we know what, what it's all about, why we're doing it. Now there is some controversy around it, so, but I'm not gonna go into that. But there is some, like we said, pros and cons to the whiteboard challenge. So now we know, okay, we need to be prepared for this. This is something that companies are doing. How do we do it? One is to have some sort of framework for yourself, some process that you can apply and it can adapt to just about any design challenge that's thrown your way. Okay. And what you're going to notice here is that it's very similar to the design thinking process except this has to be done in an hour. So we don't have time for user testing and building up prototypes and all of that, right? So it's a very lean, quick version. And this is the framework I use that I'm sharing with you guys. So you can use it, adapt it, change it, manipulate it for what works best for you. But this is the framework we're gonna work off of today. So number one, understanding the problem. Right? What is the problem we're trying to solve? That's what we always try to start with defining the problem, generating ideas, so ideation, fleshing out a solution, and then we're gonna summarize and reflect on this process. All right, so let's 
do one together. Hooray! <laughs> this is going to make, uh, hopefully make you feel more comfortable. We're going to do this together. I'm going to, again, ask for your participation in this. So here is the design challenge prompt. Imagine that the interviewer gave you this prompt, okay? And here it is, they read it out loud to you and it says, since the rise of electric scooter companies, City Ride, a bike subscription company, has seen a decrease in their bike share subscriptions. They're looking to rebrand and discover ways to attract those scooter commuters, okay? So they wanna win back scooter commuters. Now, what do we do first? We wanna understand deeper into the problem. First, what we wanna do, so imagine this is our whiteboard, okay? On the left-hand side, we're gonna spend about 10 minutes in this first part, understanding the problem is really gathering context. This is where we're going to be asking a lot of follow-up questions to that design prompt. We don't typically just get started and boom, boom, here we go with the solution. This is where we're actually gonna probably have the most involvement with the interviewer. I will say, sometimes an interviewer will say, Pretend I'm a stakeholder. You're just asking me questions from my business and that's it. Sometimes they'll say, let's pretend like we're a team and you're collaborating with me as a designer or a product manager, et cetera. But for today's scenario, we're just gonna imagine that they are just our stakeholder and we're doing a lot of this on our own. We're not doing a lot of collaboration with them, okay? So what we're gonna do is ask our stakeholder a lot of follow-up questions. We're wanting to understand further the business objectives, user objectives, any constraints that we have that could be technical or any other constraints that we need to consider, as well as success metrics. How will we measure success? These are things that we're going to try to clarify in this first 10 minutes. Now we time block it because Sometimes you can get lost in solutions and lost in questions. And then at the end, you don't actually have any final solution that you can share. So this is a big problem. We need to make sure we're cognizant of our time. Okay, so let's get into our example here. Let's pretend this is our whiteboard. And what I do is I first try to make sure I'm putting a little summary of the prompt above so I can remember it. When I'm feeling nervous and anxious, sometimes I'm like, what am I doing? What am, what am I trying to solve, right? So you wanna ground yourself in writing it out on the whiteboard and being like, okay, this is the problem I'm trying to solve. This is the prompt, okay? Sometimes they'll give you a little piece of paper or something like that. If you want, you can have that readily available too. But if it was verbal, you wanna write it out. Then you wanna talk about the business objectives. So you might ask them, okay, is there any uh, other business objectives or business objectives you wanna share? So we learned that uh, our stakeholder uh, interviewer has said, well, we wanna win back those scooter commuters. That's what they wanna do. They wanna win them back. Okay, do we know what the user objectives are? Do you know anything about your users? Okay, well, we know that um, the stakeholder says, we know that they want a reliable mode of transportation. Okay, pretty high level, right? Sure. Is there any constraints? And they say, no. Okay. But I want to let you know, constraint examples. Uh, sometimes, let's say, uh, you some constraints could be like, uh, our users don't have phones. That could be, or they don't use, or they don't have internet on their phone, right? Stuff like this, these can be constraints. So you're like, okay, this is a design problem, but there are challenges, other mini challenges along the way, right? That we have to sidestep. Sometimes there's no, no constraints. In this case, that's what we're gonna go with. And our success metric is an increase in those monthly bike subscriptions. That's how we are gonna measure our success. Okay. Now what we're gonna do is look at the problem space. And this is where we're going to spend another 10 minutes. So we're diving deeper into understanding the problem. We got some context. We want to explore problems even more. <laughs> UX designers love getting into those problems. So 
We want to explore business and user problems, as well as more of the user needs use cases. So we want to really dive into who this user is. Now, you can ask the stakeholder, is there any other business problems that I should be aware of? And they can say, yeah, no, that's it. Or, and if so, you can even ask, well, can I make some assumptions up for your business problems? And if they say, sure, go ahead. Okay, well, we know that they have low subscriptions. One of our assumptions is that they're feeling out of date. They're no longer relevant. We have to add assumptions up, create stories, because we do not have time to look at metrics, to interview stakeholders, to interview users, to really build up that context based in reality. A big part of what we do as UX designers is create assumptions, and then we validate through testing, right? But we don't have time for that. So that's what we're doing is a lot of assumptions in this period at this point. So user needs. Some of the assumptions that we came up with now for our user is that he needs motivation to work out and help him hit his fitness goals. So he, we're finding out that people who are going on, uh, were our assumptions, people who started to go all into scooters, electric scooters, were starting to gain weight and starting to not feel as confident and healthy because they're no longer on bikes anymore. That's our, our assumption. We also assume that he wants a bike that is reliable and regularly serviced. He wants something that actually feels like it's going to take him from A to B every day to work, right? Some problems he's had, he's gained weight. He's been using those scooters. He's not been working out. He doesn't feel good in himself, right? Um, he also feels like the bike is not reliable because bikes are used many times. Sometimes he's experienced chains break off. And what do you do now at that point, right? So he's, that's a big problem for him. He also dislikes bringing his own helmet. That was another <laughs> Another problem I came up with. So what I would like for you guys to do now in the chat is add some more assumptions to this. What other assumptions would you provide for the user needs or some of the user problems for somebody who used to ride in an electric scooter or sorry, used to ride in bikes, became an electric scooter rider? How do we win back those, pe those people? What are some of the problems that they have, some of the needs that they have to bring them back to the bike? Well, how do we bring them back to the bike? Let's see in the chat, guys. Let's take a second to think about it. John says bikes are bulkier than scooters. Yeah, that could be a big issue. During COVID, oh yeah, during COVID, the, um, they don't wanna touch unsanitized bikes as well. Ooh, good one. Like it. The cost is too high, says Brian. Yeah, that's a good one. I wonder too what my assumption would be around bike costs versus electric scooters. Um, I almost wonder, yeah, if bikes would be cheaper, perhaps too. You can't transport so much stuff. Yeah, bikes don't need charging. That's a good one, Lori. Yeah. Parking the bike, says Pablo. Yes, scooter is more fun. <laughs> yes, Sibidi, Sibidi. Yes, I hear you on that. Um, what else do we have? You guys have some good ones here. The parking spot is too far away from home and work. That could be a big problem. Maybe one of her user needs, Serena says, faster way of getting to work. Yeah, these are great. You guys have so many. Wow, so many great. So you guys are great at already creating assumptions here on user needs and user problems. Perfect. You guys have now aced this section. We're able to move forward. All right. So now we have an understanding of the problem. But now, as you guys can see, we have so many problems, right? And so that's where we want to define the problem and figure out how to narrow down our options to the critical few that are going to have the most impact. Okay. So in my example, what I narrowed it down to, I, I decided I was going to go with the gained weight since he's been doing scooters. Okay. That's the one I decided to go with. And I felt like the impact 
is going to be really relevant to the business problems of feeling out of date and not relevant to because um, as you, you know, during the pandemic and everything, people are staying at home, they're not out and working out as often. And I think health is going to be coming, becoming more of a trend, people getting out there, getting healthy, working out more. And I feel like we can like rebrand ourselves to think more about how to be healthier and help people to, um, to, to get to get healthy <laughs> and lose his weight. So that's the problem that I've decided to focus on. Now, you might say, that's not the best problem to solve. You might have a different opinion and that's okay. This is where we're showing our different ways of thinking. And when you are doing this exercise in front of someone, you wanna explain just like I did why I'm moving forward with an idea. And again, this is time sensitive. So we don't have time to, again, think about metrics or through everything so intensely. We have a limited amount of time we have to move forward. Okay, so we move forward with this idea. Now we're ready for the fun part, generating ideas. I can already tell you guys are gonna be good at this. So <laughs> generating ideas. This, this is our whiteboard on the upper right hand side is our solution space. This is where we're gonna think about all the different solutions for this problem. This whole area for solutions should take us about 25 minutes, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, okay? And um, just to clarify, this is a, a one hour long uh, whiteboard challenge we would be doing, and that's pretty typical, okay, one hour long. So one of the ways that I like to think about ideation and creating different ways to solve problem is to use the how might we questions. So this is a framework that was pioneered by IDEO. They are one of the biggest design agencies in the world. And they created this to unlock innovation because we can come up with solutions, right? We would see those needs, we'd see those problems and we'd probably come up with a list of, you know, five to seven good solutions. But in order to unlock more creativity, more innovation, we need to use different exercises to take us that next step forward to un to really unleash something within ourselves. And this is one way that I highly recommend to uh, for designers to use is to think a little bit more creatively during the whiteboard challenge with this exercise. So this question helps us to turn challenges into opportunities and address the problem in many different ways. So let's go into this. Let's see what that that could look like. So let's step away from our bike. Okay, let's go into this example of, of pretending that, you know, we want to improve the air travel experience. So let's say we're improving air travel. We would use this how might we in these different ways. So I'm going to show you how uh, the different ways that you can use the how might we. Number one, you can use the how might we to explore the opposite. So for example, how might we make the wait at the airport the most exciting part of the trip? That's exploring the opposite, right? Because usually the wait is so like, uh, so tiring. But how can we make it the most exciting? So you're seeing we're framing a question. We're not creating a solution yet. These are the how might we questions. Next step is solutions, okay? So how might we to create this question that can potentially start to unlock some more creative solutions? We can question an assumption. So how might we entirely remove the wait time at the airport? Whoa, it's an assumption that we have that we have to wait at the airport. What if we questioned that assumption? We can go after adjectives. So how might we make the rush refreshing? instead of difficult, right? So how can we make it ex refreshing, this whole experience? Another one is create an analogy from a need or a want. So how can we make the airport like a spa or like a playground? That can be, you can kind of really unlock some more fun, fun, fun ideas there. And then also, how can we break the point of view into pieces? So how might we so soothe delayed passengers? So we're breaking down the point of view to just that, just that group of people 
who have are delayed, right? Because that's such a big problem and pain point people have at the airport. So this is how you can start to use how might we. Let's bring it back, boop, boop, back to our, our bike subscription example. And I wanna show you here are some of the how might we questions I created for this exercise. The first one is how might we make this app feel more like a motivational health and fitness app? So <laughs> instead of feeling like it's just a, you know, a bird or a lime or another sort of uh, subscription, you know, rental for a scooter or bike, how can we make it feel more like a motivational health and fitness app? So that was a question I posed to myself. And one of the solutions I came up with here you'll see on the left hand side, I was drawing it is a dashboard where they have their calories and his miles that he's rode his bike for the week, he can see his progress. So that was one of my solutions to that. Now when you're doing solutions, you can sketch something really fast like I did, or you can just write out a solution. It all depends on how your brain works and how how you unlock creativity for yourself. Another how might we I came up with was how might we make him feel super fit and excited to get on that bike. So I have this like big muscle man and I showed I'm showing his uh, different sessions and the calories he's burned for for all of them and showing him build muscle or something. Again, it could be totally fine. It's totally okay to be ridiculous. It's to, to have um, brainstorm ideas that are wild and fun. Okay, we can always bring it back. And then this is one I use um, and I pull this out and people will be like surprised by this one, but I kind of go really like, what is the worst way I can think about this? So how might we make him feel guilty for not working out? How can we make him feel really bad? <laughs> so this is one way I use to kind of also help me unlock some more creativity. And I've seen a lot of people turn bad ideas into great ideas. So mine for that is like, I have this guy and he's, like really becoming bigger and bigger and it's like you've gained four pounds since the last time now that's a terrible idea but it's okay <laughs> we don't have to be married to these ideas they're just ideas really quickly right this is done in the matter of two or three minutes so you guys i want you guys to create some how might we's what are some how might we's that you would use so you can go ahead and explore the opposites Right? What's the kind of opposite experience you imagine? Question assumption. What's an, an assumption we have about riding bikes? How can we question that? Go after adjectives. Create an analogy from a need or a want. So make it like a spa or a playground. Breaking the point of view into pieces. You guys, how might we make sweat the most desired part of biking? <laughs> Lalika, that's a good one. I like that. How might we make him feel good about himself, says Alexandra? Yeah, that's wonderful. How do we make him feel so nice and wonderful in himself? Prima says, how might we gamify the bike experience? Yeah, that's awesome. How might we make the bike commute more cost effective? Super cool. That's a great one. How might we show the biking is safer? Ooh, nice one, Paul. Yeah, especially if that was a big problem for him, safety. That would be great. Um, we see another one. How might we help the user lose weight while riding? Yeah, what if we even, because that could help us come up with some interesting solutions. What if there's like, you know, he puts like on his bag um, some weights that are attached to the bike and he's like doing extra. You know, maybe you can like up the the amount of workout you can do on the bike, depending on the setting, right? So this again is helping us to, these questions are helping to unlock creativity. And when I do this with groups, it's so fun to, to like balance these ideas off each other, right? Um, I'm loving these. You guys have created so many. Yes. Offering different types of bikes can motivate to try. Yeah, I love that. Tara Powell says, how might we make the bikes feel more environmentally conscious for biking? That's a great one. Yeah, especially if we want to attract more environmentally conscious people um, or people who are kind of on the, the verge, you know, they're a little bit conscientious, but how can we really show them the, the impact too? That could be really interesting. All right, wonderful ideas, guys. You guys have some great uh, 
some great ones. And if you if you want, I'd love for you guys to come up with some solutions, not only to your own, but to the ones you're seeing here. What are some potential solutions, brainstorms, could be totally blue sky, no constraints, just having fun, brainstorm ideas to some of these solutions and not feeling tied to them, just letting them kind of riff riff off the off of your head what what are some solutions to some of these they could be a, a, about my how might we some other people's in the chat your own what will we see here and now there's a pause solutions <laughs> we're still thinking about the question all right i also like how how about we make the app feel like a social media that's cool Here's a solution. Biking is less harmful to nature, says Muhammad. Yeah. Rihanna says integrated naps and navigating feature. Ashley says nine rides and 10 free. Cool. Reward for using the bike on a regular basis. Yeah, I love that. What reward would we give them? What would they want? Generate energy by, by pedaling. <laughs> yeah, gamification of weight loss. Cool, these are awesome. Showing where he burns more and less calories. Ooh, Lilika, that's great. Yeah, maybe like the pass that he burns, maybe he has like three paths he takes to work and one of them he burns like 20% more calories and we can show him that and he'd be like, okay, I should maybe do that path. Loving these ideas, great ideas. Isn't this the fun part? <laughs> it's my favorite. So now we have so many solutions right? And we want to flesh out a solution. So down here at the bottom right um, corner here, this is where we're going to fo focus on one solution in depth. So you're going to pick a solution and you're going to talk about why you selected that solution, right? So we had talked about, um, I had decided for mine that I wanted to really focus on the dashboards solution, that we have a dashboard with his progress, the amount of calories he's burning per um, per ride, how many miles, et cetera. That's the one I decided to focus on. So from here, I want to show the flows, some of the key screens. So I'm gonna to start to get sketching. Here's my sketches. Now, so you can tell, sketches do not have to be pretty, <laughs> especially when you're in a time crunch. But what's important is that you're able to really explain it as you go through it. And so the interviewer understands your progression and your thought process. So here, you know, I have this scenario, this that he wants to get fit. He's um, signed up for this subscription. He's about to um, book his bike. Uh, for the day and he is booking it from his house. So I had like the first step where he opens up the app, he reserves the bike. Um, I even have it to where he's actually walking to the bike and I have the experience of the bike noticing with like a, having a beacon experience where it knows that the person is coming close by. And so it'll say, hey, Adam, hop on or it'll say your name and hop on. So even thinking about these kind of how it really it, uh, can affect all these different aspects of his experience. So what is the actual physical bike experience like? Um, and then I have it so that it buzzes on his phone and it says it's unlocked. So there's two ways he knows that the bike is unlocked. Maybe um, if he has any hearing disability, he can't hear, hi, Tom, hop on. He can feel it physically buzz and see it. So I'm also thinking about accessibility here as well. And then I have the total that after he's, you know, ridden his bike, here's the calories he burned, the miles, if he reached his goal, et cetera. So I'm showing all of this experience. And again, it doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to look great, but you have to be able to explain it. Now, the final aspect of this is to summarize and reflect. What does that mean? Well, what you want to do at the very end is to take five minutes to summarize your whole from A to Z, the business objective, how you, uh, the problem that you decided to solve, 
the solutions you came up with, why you decided to move forward with it, and then a little rough um, idea of kind of the, the key screens that you created. So you're just summarizing your story. And you're also taking time to reflect and talk about, okay, these are some areas that maybe I should have improved upon or some of the areas that I, I'm feeling like it's not, it's not really fleshed out. It's not a great idea yet. You can definitely, we, it's encouraged to talk about it at this point. So you can say, I decided to go with weight loss, but I'm not really sure if weight loss is the right option. Like maybe there's not enough people who are trying to lose weight um, riding scooters. So actually maybe it won't increase bike subscription. So that would be something I would like to explore. Right. So you can talk about the different things that you're like, I went more, I went forward with this, but I'm really not sure. It's not maybe the best idea. That's OK. This is not is not about perfection. OK, why do we care about this? Because self-awareness is one of the most important skills for a UX designer. Yes, like Gary Busey. Ah, OK, this is one of the most sought after skills. And I've talked to many hiring managers and this is one of the number one things is people to be aware that not everything I do is perfect. I'm aware that some of these solutions isn't completely thought through and that's okay, right? And it also kind of could give us like a little bit of a, a breather to be like, okay, perfect. Okay, we don't have to be perfect. Oh, that feels good, right? So it gives us a little bit of that relief as well. So now we've completed our first whiteboard challenge together. And Jason says, I feel like this is an elaborate form of Pictionary. You know what? There's actually these games. There's one I have called Startup, where it gives you like a kind of basically a design prompt. Like you need to design this, this type of thing for these types of users. And it's a game, right? So it's actually kind of one way to think about it is like it's kind of a fun game to play. Um, and I enjoy doing it. So <laughs> maybe you guys do too. All right, common mistakes. Jumping into solutions too soon. So why I say 10 minutes in context, 10 minutes in problem solving, that's almost half the time building the foundation, understanding the context, understanding the problem, having that foundation built out, it's solid first before jumping into a bunch of solutions, okay? Time management. This is one of the number one things that people get stumped on when they first begin is time management. So something that you can think about doing as well is you can ask the interviewer for a time check. That's totally okay. Like, where are we at in time? Like, okay, I I'm going to wrap up this really quickly and move on to the next phase. So um, that's totally okay to ask. You don't have to be perfect. And also have a little watch, you know, check out. Oh, okay. I see my little watch here. It's time to move forward into the next section. So that's why it's good to have an understanding of the different around the time that you should be spending on each part of the process. Not explaining your thought process. This is probably one of the hardest things for people when they begin is like, how do I like create solutions and do all this and have my framework, but also be talking through this to someone else and explaining it in a way that really makes sense and that for the other person to like be on board and understand what they're saying and the story you're trying to convey, it can be challenging, right? It can be when, especially when you're nervous. Um, so there are different techniques to really flesh this, flesh out your process and feel more confident. One of the number one things is to practice, right? So I'm gonna show you some, um, some places where you can get little design prompts and you can practice. You can do them 15 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour. Maybe you build up to an hour. And what I highly recommend is for you to record yourself. Yes, ah, so uncomfortable. <laughs> record yourself doing it and going through it as if you were talking to someone and having an interview or being able to explain the different things that you're doing. And then you're going to review that recording and evaluate yourself. What are things that you did really well? What are things that you could improve upon, right? Once you feel confident doing it in front of yourself, 
Now you can start practicing with other people and you can totally do this virtually. Have a buddy, give each other whiteboard challenges. And you can also go to the next step of getting a mentor or a coach to do it with you as well. But there's so many ways to continuously practice the skill and get confident in yourself. Okay, talking about fears. Let, these are some common fears that come up that I hear. The number one fear is the fear of the unknown. So what is the design challenge I'm gonna get? I'm super nervous, I'm scared. Um, and this is pretty common. I actually felt this way so recently. I, I mentioned I, I did one for Facebook. And the design challenge they gave me was for a product that I didn't even know what it was. It was a, a not a digital product, it was a physical product that I wasn't, I didn't know what it was. And I was like, ah, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> so I straight up said, I don't, I don't know what that is. Um, and I felt like such a dummy, but, um, <laughs> and I kept having to be like, okay, I guess I'm trying to, I'm just going to move forward with what I think it is and his expl explanation. And you know, it, it worked out, but I, I have to be explicit and it's okay. So I kind of have to roll with the punches. So doing again, these little exercises, this is one here, designer size. It says like, it'll give you the design, who it's for, who to help, et cetera. This is a great way to just like give yourself like crazy, throw, throw, it, throw yourself off by like having these crazy exercises and then just moving forward. Like there's like a stun, kind of like a stun effect initially, but just trust yourself, trust your framework and you'll be okay. All right, fear number two, fear of public speaking. So this is the number one thing people are like, I'm scared to talk and maybe like even in front of one person or five to seven people in a room. That's scary. I, all the focus is on me. And one of the ways to move forward from this and to overcome this fear is to take a public speaking class, right? And so I went through Toastmasters and it's a nonprofit and it's offered all over the world to practice your public speaking skills. And you can do this virtually. So that's one aspect. But the other thing I do is I suggest to challenge yourself to put yourself a little bit out there, a little bit, make yourself a little bit uncomfortable in front of, uh, you know, in some sort of public way, a little bit to kind of keep to keep pushing yourself so that you start to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, one of the ways why I feel so comfortable doing these exercises and even doing a talk like this is because six, seven years ago, I was trying to be a performer. One of the things my vocal coach told me to do is go to karaoke three times a week. And the first time I did it, oh my gosh, I was so nervous. I probably had a beer too many and I sang terribly and it was just so embarrassing. And, um, but I kept going back. I did three times a week. And so after three months, by the time I had my first performance myself, I was so confident. I was cool as a cucumber. And that experience has translated to myself doing any sort of public speaking now. And I constantly am pushing. That's why I did Toastmasters. I'm constantly doing it, making myself uncomfortable. And you'll just start to be like, oh, this is no big deal. Okay. Fear number three, fear of messing up. We Someone else mentioned this earlier, right? That's why we have that time to reflect. It's okay to say, oh yeah, you know, I probably shouldn't have done this because of X, Y, Z. It's, it's, that's the point where you can talk about it. You can also, if you're so nervous during, it's okay to say, you know what? I'm just feeling a little bit nervous right now. That's okay. Sometimes that helps break the ice a little bit. And you can like have a little, kind of a fun little joke with the, with the evaluator. So it, it's okay and it's normal. But just know that it's again, not about that perfection piece. It's about process, communication skills, et cetera. And that's, this is just one aspect of the interview process. It's not the end all be all, okay? So there are different points where someone, even if you messed up, and I've seen this before, people are like, I totally messed up on my whiteboard challenge. They've still been hired for the other things that they were evaluated on. So don't think that it is the, the nail on the coffin. All right, let's talk quickly about what interviewers are evaluating. What does the interviewer, what are they looking at? 
I'm looking for during this process. So problem definition, how well can you explore the problem space and identify big problems to go after? So you're not just thinking about uh, really something small that may not actually make a difference for the business or the user, right? We wanna think about big impactful problems. Solution finding and idea generation. So can you explore multiple creative options? and not be married or attached to any. So that's another one thing. I do this all the time too, and I have to like force myself, like don't get attached to this. This is not the best idea in the world. There are many solutions. So that's one way for you, for us to evaluate. Like, can you just come up with many and not be too attached? Interaction design knowledge. So is your story and interaction flow coherent? Does it make sense when you're explaining the flow or am I so lost and confused? I don't know how this relates to each other or how it relates to the business objective. It has to all be a coherent story and make sense. And then collaboration. So the questions that you ask the interviewers and also, um, sometimes the interviewer interviewer will give some suggestions or push you in a certain direction a little bit or ask you certain questions. So you just have to be open to collaborating with that in whatever, whatever they, that interviewer is kind of requesting. So you want to just kind of also be flexible, not be so attached to your framework that if something is asked from the interviewer that you don't even take that into consideration, like I need to move on with my framework. It should be it should be able to um, stretch and flow depending on the actual situation that you're in, right? So finally, how to stand out um, in a world full of princesses? Dare to be the Batman. I love the kid the way he's staring at us, staring at us in the eyes. Um, propose unconventional solutions so the how might we is going to help you get there that's why i showed it unconventional solutions don't just try to take exactly something that other people are doing and take that exact pattern and apply it to this product right especially if it may not make a hundred percent sense don't just copy and paste an idea right that's one of ways one of the ways to stand out not copy and paste other ideas unconventional solutions, great storytelling and communication skills, which we've talked a lot about how to practice that. And then look at the problem from multiple lenses. This is one of the ways to also really stand out. When I talked about thinking about accessibility, that's a big positive, right? I'm thinking about um, different types of users too. Um, thinking about business, from the business perspective, also thinking about engineering, you don't wanna think about potentially a solution that's like, that will never be designed um, or can never be developed or take years, or there's not even that side of type of technology. You can ask the interviewer, do you want me to think of like blue sky, like anything goes, or do you want me to think about something more based in reality too? So you can have all those solutions and then you can you can ask those questions. So thinking about these multiple lenses is a way to stand out. Major takeaways, practice, practice, practice. Did I say it enough? Practice, 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 three more times. Um, and also design challenges don't require perfection. Let that go, let that go, relax and have a framework ready. And most of all, I think, enjoy it. Enjoy exercises. When you start to get comfortable with them and practice, it starts to become fun, like a game, like we mentioned earlier. All right, so feel free. That's that's the session. We're gonna get into QA. Feel free to message me. I offer free group mentorship a month. I also have about three to four events every month around UX. Um, so feel free to connect with me on all the platforms. I know I'm on all of them. And let's continue these conversations. Um, here are a few resources that I'm gonna put into the chat for you, ways that you can get some of these design props so you can start playing and working on some of them. And so we'll put that there. And also, again, this presentation will be shared with you. So let's open it up now to the Q&A. We got 10 minutes. Fantastic, Elisa. Thank you so much. We have so many questions. Um, so let's start with um, this one. How do you do a whiteboard challenge online? So it depends on the company. Um, sometimes you can use, I mentioned it earlier, Miro and Mural. 
and they're both free to get started with and I can give you the links there. Um, sometimes you can also even do it in your design tool. So if you're using a design tool that you can share with someone through the cloud, you guys can just be working off of that design tool and you don't even have to use the bandwidth of screen sharing. So um, there's also, you can, uh, some companies are okay with one of my whiteboard challenges I did. I actually had a physical whiteboard in my room and I just did that in front of the camera. Um, another company offered to pay for a whiteboard for me to have, if that's something I felt comfortable with. So usually uh, it depends on the company and what they suggest, but I would start with what you're comfortable doing. Try out something, maybe you just try out a tool you're comfortable with or just try pen and paper or whiteboard and gradually move forward into um, other design tools when you start to feel more confident and comfortable. Nice, and talking about those tools, what tools do you use to do freehand sketches during a virtual whiteboard exercise? Can you use Miro and tools like this? You can, it's just a little bit more challenging. Like you can actually draw in Miro and everything like that. Um, but it's, uh, I, I would say it's much easier to draw on a piece of paper than it is in there. So that is an option. Um, so that's why I think, go ahead and try it out and maybe you can feel confident in it. It's not something that I feel super confident in, um, but it's an option. So there's that. And there's also drawing out sketches. You can draw it out in front of people and then you can just upload it later so they can get a closer view into it as well too. And there was a lot of questions about the structure of the, of the whiteboard challenge. Does the recruiter sit there with you the whole time throughout one hour? How often do you speak to this person? Do you need to like constantly um, basically check in with this person, explain what you're doing? Can you take like five minutes off and like just think? What do you think? <laughs> you just have to talk the entire time, 60 minutes. Um, no, uh, so oftentimes, most oftentimes people are, are in the room with you. And you can take time to take breaks and just think maybe for five minutes. You might just want to explain that. Like, I'm just going to take a few minutes and think about some solutions. So you're just talking through that and you're going to do that. And then you would say, okay, these are the solutions I came up with. Um, these are the ones that I want to move forward with. These ones that I think maybe don't work well. So you're just like, going to be explaining throughout, but you can definitely take moments and pauses as you go through it. But it, it doesn't require a lot a lot of communication throughout because it's again showing your design process and so you don't want to have 20 minutes of just you know nothingness if there is typically the interviewer will ask you questions if it's quiet for too long like okay what are you thinking oh why are you going forward with that so if you forget um, i'm sure someone will remind you <laughs> great um for a ux researcher not a designer role should I spend more time on context and problem space instead of solution? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I haven't seen this exercise done for just specifically UX researchers. Um, I would imagine that it would be probably much more heavily on the beginning pieces. And, um, I would imagine there might be other layers to it. Instead of building out screens, you might be more thinking about um, questions you would ask the user or maybe the research technique that you would use, um, depending on the problem. I've seen for just specific UI designers, visual designers, there's a lot more focus on the visual aspect too. So. Um, I've seen whiteboard challenges where you've done up to what we did today. And then they give the designer 30 minutes to be in the room by themselves um, in a tool and fleshing out a couple screens to show their actual design tool skills as well. Um, obviously, because of uh, current situation, there are quite a few questions about take home challenges. Um, so how are they different from whiteboard challenge? If you receive a home take uh, take home challenge, what quality should your finished product be? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, usually, the person who's providing it will give you that context. So typically, they'll say it's about please spend ten to fifteen hours on this, get up to this point. So maybe they'll say um, you know three to five wireframes, one to two high fidelity, or they'll say go up to a um, 
prototype. So it's up to the company to decide how um, the type of fidelity that they're requiring. And it also depends on what it usually depends on what that company is looking for more specifically. Are they looking for more of a visual designer versus somebody who's going to go deeper into research um, or they want something, someone that's definitely going to be more um, a generalist. So those, those requirements and constraints will be given to you with those take home challenges and they vary. Um, but like I said, I've, most people I've interviewed always go over in time and oftentimes try to go a little above and beyond to stand out. So I've, I've heard that time and time again. So that's some of the challenge with that take home challenge. Um, and kind of coming back to basics, which companies traditionally ask you to compete the whiteboard challenge? Um, I'd say most companies, um, unless they're not that, um, unless they don't already have a design team, that's really, I call it design mature. So what that means is that the company doesn't really understand fully the UX process. They may not actually involve it that much in their product life cycle. They just hire someone who's a UX designer um, and they call them UX UI. They don't know the difference. So somebody, some, a company like that who's low in that design maturity might not have something like this. Companies that are very high in that are very design mature are definitely going to have uh, a whiteboard challenge or at least the take home challenge and that full process that I showed earlier. Great. Um, funny question. I like sticky notes. Would it be weird to bring my own during the interview? <laughs> I like this question. I'm not sure what you would use them for. Um, so unless you're maybe like showing a flow or something like that, if, it, if it's part of your process, if you like it, sure. I don't think it's weird. Go for it. Um, you might ask though, hey, is it okay if I use my sticky notes? So maybe don't ask, <laughs> ask them. <laughs> um, are there any specific terms or concepts that uh, they, I guess the recruiters uh, could be expecting from you in a whiteboard challenge? Hmm. How, yeah, that's a good question. I don't think so um, because this again, is really just getting into the problem space and letting your letting it simmer and letting your mind, allowing your mind to kind of really think creatively. And I think that's really what we want to see. Understanding terminology and jargon and all of that, it's it's a nice to have. So, um, you know, and honestly, you know, if you want to say this is a specific UI element and this is a floating action button, this, it's not so important. And especially if you're a junior designer or mid-level designer and you're not, you're not expected to know all of those things. So I think just focusing more on those key aspects, those foundational aspects is what's important. The, the, the problem solving skills and the communication skills, which everyone can do. Nice. Are proto personas important to have in a whiteboard challenge or would that be more for take home challenge? So um, you can use them for both. And I've done um, little mini ones. I'm not gonna spend time like really fleshing out this person's backstory, scenario. I'm not gonna go so deep into it. I'm hitting on a couple needs, a couple pain points, maybe some demographics, especially if they provided it to me. So I'll ask, um, do you uh, do you have do you know anything about your your demographics? And sometimes they provide that, sometimes they don't. You can make assumptions. So it's totally great, if, especially if you find that it helps you with your process and problem solving to dive deeper. Go ahead and do that. Just don't spend too much time. Again, we're always like. We need, to, we need to move forward fairly quickly. So a fast little persona is great. <laughs> and I think this is uh, a fantastic last question uh, for today. Can you remember your first whiteboard, whiteboard challenge? How did it go? Uh, my first one, okay, yes, now I remember. Um, my first whiteboard challenge actually was through my design boot camp program and it was two instructors in the room and it was just me by myself and i was so scared i remember being um very very nervous and thinking throughout as i was going through that like is this the right way of doing it am i thinking am i going sometimes my brain can go off into tangents so i can be going through like 
I was designing something for babysitters, um, a babysitter app. So I was designing and thinking about both the babysitter profile as well as the person who's hiring. So I was going, I think maybe even too, too deep for that hour. So I remember thinking like, I need to rein this in. Like maybe I'm going too far deep, <laughs> but that's okay. Yeah, right. That's how you learn. <laughs> Fantastic. Elise, thank you so much. That was extremely useful. Uh, so many great comments in the chat. I've never seen this chat room so engaged. So um, well done. Thank you all for participating, for giving um, us your opinions, uh, how my we and, and different statements. Um, and with that, yeah, I want to wish you a good morning, good evening, wherever you're based. Uh, and yeah, we'll see you soon. Yay. Thank you guys so much for all your participation. Had so much fun today. Hope to see you guys soon. Yeah.